Hi, my name is Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and I'm also co-chair of the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association Preventative Health Committee. And I'm really excited to be here tonight with Dr. Ellie Carmody, who's done this a number of times with me. Thank you so, so much for doing this. You're very welcome. Dr. Carmody is an infectious disease physician. She received her medical degree from Mount Sinai School of Medicine and a Master's of Public Health from Columbia University. She completed a residency in internal medicine at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center, and her fellowship in infectious disease at NYU School of Medicine. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine and is the director of infectious disease clinic at Bellevue Hospital Center. So we're here tonight to talk about the upcoming COVID-19 vaccines. You know, the new term is the light at the end of the tunnel. Everyone's starting mm -hmm. to say this over and over and over, and I really like that. I find it very yeah. reassuring that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so let's start with just what's out there. I know there are so many potential vaccines. Can we start with just talking about the ones that are most likely? Sure. So the one, of course, which is, uh, you know, pending the FDA approval and review it two days from now on December 10th is the Pfizer vaccine and very soon after that the Moderna vaccine and that's on uh, I believe the the meeting is on December 17th and if those proceed well those will be um, issued an EUA uh, or emergency use authorization um, by the FDA and then those will be the first to be rolled out those two are, fall into what are called the mRNA vaccine class and um, if you'd like, I could go into that now, or we could defer that for later, and I'll, I'll describe yeah, sure, the Sure, sure, because I, I know that people are concerned about mRNA. Sure, it's something okay. new, a new way to do vaccines. Sure. So the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, the, the mRNA technology is basically, um, uh, it is a new technology, so there, there is a learning curve, and there's a lot we don't know. Um, but essentially, the mRNA is a genetic product um, which encodes for the spike protein. And the spike protein is that protein within the coronavirus that provides that little stud on the, on the envelope of the virus that gives it that crown-like appearance and is the protein that allows the virus to bind and thus enter into cells in the human body. So these two vaccines, and essentially all of these vaccines, they're, what they're using as their target is that spike protein. They're essentially wanting the, to, uh, uh, causing the body to produce antibodies to that spike protein to keep it from binding to cells and thus preventing the virus from entering cells. And then once you add, prevent, prevent it from entering the cells or binding to cells, you, you want you know, your antibodies to actually neutralize this virus. Um, and then in addition to that, you want it to induce other types of memory. So memory T cells and B cells that can provide longer lasting immunity um, to, to protect um, to people from, from coronavirus in the, you know, not, not just the very short term, but the sh you know, mid, mid long term to the long term. Um, so back to the Pfizer Moderna vaccines, these two vaccines are using the uh, genetic product that encodes for that spike protein um, and basically enveloping it within a lipid particle. Um, I'm sorry, and then, why, why, why is that important that it has to go in that lipid particle? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way for it to get into the body without being degraded, um, without being recognized as foreign and then basically um, knocked out of the body before it's even gotten the chance to get into any cells. So it needs to get into cells, not the nucleus of cells, but just the cytoplasm of cells so that it can be um, transcribed to, into that protein by our, by our own cells, by, the own, by the own, our own machinery within our cells. And uh, when it becomes the protein, then our own, then we can start producing the antibodies um, and the T cells and the B cells uh, towards that. Right, so um, on a very protein. simple level, just because people hear mRNA and they get it confused sometimes with DNA, it's important that you said it doesn't get into the nucleus. It just is delivering a message. This is how you make a protein. It is not changing your cells. It is not permanently doing anything to your cells. Right, and it breaks exactly. down so easily. We've got to cushion it in this lipid layer, just so it doesn't break down, you know, from the vaccine into your body. Correct, absolutely. 
Although people have also said, well, okay, well, if it breaks down fast, then how is it ever going to work? And then again, you go back to that lipid layer. Yeah, you go back to that lipid layer. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, interestingly, that that is why we have the cold chain requirements for these two vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the Pfizer being much colder than the Moderna. But, um, you know, we, but the mRNA breaks down so quickly, even that even within these, uh, these lipid particles, um, you need to keep it very cold in order mm -hmm. for it to stop uh, breaking, to, for it not to break down. So, um, that that is one of the limitations of these of this technique in terms of rolling it out uh, in a mass on a mass scale um, for the for the world, um, particularly in countries that don't have a cold chain. Um, and just one more question: Why are we using yeah. this mRNA technology if we've never used it before? What? Mm -hmm. Why are we using it now? Yeah, I think one of the advantages of it is the ability to very very rapidly produce it um, mm -hmm. because you're you're not having to use cell cultures to produce a, you know, a, you know, attenuated virus. Um, it's, you're, you're just able to really produce it uh, and for using economies of scale um, so that we can get this rolled out very quickly. Because right, um, I'm, just, I'm just simplifying it, but instead of actually producing the protein piece of the spike protein, we're using the mRNA to tell the body to do it itself. Exactly. Good. So that's you know, much some, more. Some efficient. people would even say that this is a natural way to, to mm -hmm. more natural because your body will yeah. do it, but also easier to, to to produce because you don't have to grow the virus to Correct. grow to produce the protein, which is would be a massive undertaking to do that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, the second class of vaccines that are very close to being to market are the AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson vaccines, and these are the viral vector vaccines. Mm -hmm. And essentially, these vaccines uh, use a common cold virus called an adenovirus um, to, and they essentially insert the genetic coding for the spike protein within that virus. And so when we receive this virus, it's basically, it's a non-replicating virus. And that's very important to understand that it's been engineered so that it's a non-replicating virus and that it can't spread in your body. Basically, you whatever you get from that shot is whatever you're going to get, and that's it. Um, it's not going to reproduce within you. But it, de it does enter the cells. And then similarly, yeah, it's delivering the genetic product. And then uh, is our, our bodies are then making the protein and then making the antibodies to that protein, which constitutes our immune response. I have one question. How, 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 do we, how do we know that this, and it's just a very basic question, but how do we know that this virus won't replicate? What does non-replicating virus mean? Um, a non-replicating virus just means that they've taken out that element of the genome of mm -hmm. the adenovirus that allows it to replicate. Okay. So there are particular parts of the genome that allow it to reproduce. And we, they, the people who developed this vaccine took that part out. So there really is no way for it to replicate in your body. Do we have other vaccines that use this technology? There is an Ebola virus that uses this technology as well. Um, yeah, mm. we do. But it's, you know, it is fairly new mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the, the Russian vaccine is using this technology as well. So this is mm -hmm. the Sputnik virus, also uses the adenovirus technology. Um, and, yeah, so they've used uh, um, this vaccine. I guess they've been, have had it now for a matter of months. Mm -hmm. and. And then we have, after the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, we have the recombinant and pur purified protein with adjuvant vaccines. So these are the Sanofi slash GSK virus, I mean, sorry, uh, vaccine, and then the Novavax vaccine. And these are, uh, the class, this class is very similar to something that we've seen, you know, before. We have a significant amount of commercial experience with these types of vaccines, like the hepatitis B vaccine. And the hip, um, and the influenza uses that. And then the Shingrix oh, vaccine as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, so these, uh, you know, these are very nice vaccines, and uh, I think they might be reassuring for people uh, because we've had a lot of familiarity with this type of uh, technology. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, we do have like a the, there's the platform of the live attenuated virus, um, and we are we don't currently have that one yet in any uh, phase 
I'm not sure if it's in phase one trials, but it's certainly not in phase two or phase three. Oh, I'm going to ask you please to explain what the phases are. Absolutely. Thanks. So within vaccine development, uh, we have several different phases of, uh, that are required for testing the efficacy and the safety of vaccines. Um, first, we start with, of course, the preclinical studies. And um, in the preclinical studies, we are using an animal model um, and we're looking at, you know, does this vaccine, you know, can this vaccine have a, a, a um, targeted effect uh, in an animal model? And uh, does it cause, I mean, like a, an appropriate immuno like immunologic response in animals? Um, so all of these, all of these um, vaccines have gone through these preclinical studies, and you know this really provides you a, a proof of concept that this really could work. And so then you have your vaccine candidate, um, and then you go to phase one trials. And phase one trials are small studies, usually from you know using involving from twenty to one hundred people, where you look at varying dose ranges. And you look to see if the vaccine has the ability to induce a um, particular immune response at a level that you feel like is going to be, uh, you know, protective. And then also um, you want to look at the reactogenicity of these vaccines. Um, and these two things are very different. So the reactogenicity is basically what kind of effect that vaccine produces. So um, as an expected response. So whenever people get a vaccine, uh, there may be, you know, you may have a sore arm or you may have a slight fever or you may just feel under the weather. Or you may feel fatigued for a few hours or a day. And um, this is the, what's called reactogenicity. That's essentially a marker that your immune, your immune system is, is kind of working and it's, it's waking up and it's producing a response to that antigen or that, or that protein that is being made uh, in, in your body. Um, so that's reactogenicity. And then the, immuno, the immune response that we're measuring is the immunologic response or the actual level of antibody, the level of neutralizing antibody, the T cell response and the B cell response um, that we're looking at, um, which, which can tell us how this is going to behave um, over a longer period of time to be protective. Mm -hmm. So those are phase one studies. And once we get a, a picture of those phase one studies um, about, you know, how, what, what's the trade-off between getting particular immune response and the level of reactogenicity, um, you know, this was actually uh, when I was in phase, uh, I was in, in training at our, the NYU Vaccine Center, and uh, we were in the phase one, uh, looking, we were doing, participating in the phase one uh, Pfizer vaccine trial. And, um, you know, there was a very, they used different dose ranges and the, at the higher end of the dosing range, we certainly saw much more reactogenicity. So people get, got fever for, you know, let's say 48 hours um, and it was a higher grade fever. And then when they actually went down on the dose of the vaccine, it was actually, you know, much less reactogenic. People felt much, you know, they felt fine. Uh, not fine, but, you know, they felt like they had a mild fever and mild arm pain and fatigue. So, you know, I, I believe that they ended up going with the, you know, the sort of medium dose within that range and they didn't go with that, you know, original, um, very higher dose that they, that they were testing. I mean, it sounds obvious, but I'm sure you're trying to balance not having it be too reactive and having it be work. Exactly. Yes, immunogenic. That's, that's perfect. Yes, that's a perfect uh, summary. So then in the phase two, um, we're looking at, you know, how does the um, vaccine candidate perform in, uh, and how does it induce an immune response over, you know, perhaps different, a few different uh, populations. Um, and this is also a fairly small study, maybe a couple of hundreds of people, um, but it's, it's basically looking at, you know, can you induce this, this immune response and is it similar and, uh, you know, for example, in younger adults and older adults. And you're also looking at, does it, you know, you want to make sure that it's not causing you know, common serious side effects in this phase two study. So, and, and then you're looking again at these sort of surrogate markers, these immune, uh, these markers to assess whether this is producing an immune response that you want um, and that you think is protective, but it's not exactly telling you, is it protective? 
and then you move to the phase three trial, and that's when you're really getting information about is this vaccine protective um, and does it prevent, and in these trials, it's all been about preventing symptomatic COVID-19 illness. So we're not actually in these trials looking at does it prevent SARS-CoV-2 acquisition, that may be a secondary marker that people are looking at, but it's really been the primary efficacy endpoint has been, is this preventing symptomatic COVID-19 disease? So, um, that's right. and that's and, a really, you know, really important point though. Right. I just want right. to stop you for just a minute. That's a really, really important point because we need to know, does it stop spreading COVID? Yes. Not just does it yes. stop you from getting symptoms. And that's yeah, one reason I, why, we'll get to it later, but why people are going to need to wear masks. Right, exactly. Yeah, so vaccine. we don't have that data yet. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, we wanted to know, does this prevent people from getting sick? And then does this prevent people from becoming hospitalized and dying? Right. And uh, so those things have all been evaluated in these phase, phase three trials. Um, and so we do have information about that efficacy at this point with several of these vaccines. Right, so what do we know? And, and it also would tell us about what kind of um, side effects or adverse events in larger groups that we would see. Right, yeah. So I'd love to know what you know so, about it. You know, I think that the data with the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine is really, really promising. I mean, I think, you know, we're, what, what the press releases have informed us have been that the efficacy is 95% uh, and that there really have been um, you know, no deaths in the, in the groups that have had vaccine, and that the side effect profile or the reactogenicity, I would say, it's not, not I would say that it's not, uh, you know, there, people may be uncomfortable, um, they may have fever, I mean, I think substantially, the, the majority of people will have some degree of whether it's body aches, muscle pains, fever, chills, fatigue, you know, the vast majority of people will feel some kind of reactogenicity with these vaccines, mm -hmm. but that it lasts for a day or two and then it resolves. So, uh, you know, I think that the, the safety effect uh, or the safety profile is really encouraging at this point. And I think, you know, I don't want to be completely, um, Pollyanna-ish, I say, right. or, you know, and say that we know what the long-term safety effects of these things are. We don't. Um, you know, we have two months of data following the last injection. Um, you know, I think that I was listening to Paul Offit, who is a virologist and a vaccinologist, and said that, you know, for most of these vaccines that have been in under development, not just for COVID, but in all of the vaccines we know of, if there was a serious side effect, you knew about it within the first two months of that mm -hmm. vaccine um, being developed or being trialed. So, you know, I think that that's very promising. We're going to be giving these doses out to these vaccines out to millions and millions and millions of people. And I think it's unrealistic to expect that there will be no untoward side effects from these um, and, you know, within that massive amount of people. Um, so I think, but I see, so I think we don't know. And I think that it's promising, um, but the, the data will continue to accumulate um, and as we and basically vaccinate millions of people. And who's going to get this vaccine? Because it's not going to be for everybody at first. Yeah, no, it's actually going to be for a fairly small number of people, at least in the United States. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think this vaccine, I mean, it depends on who is uh, in your state and what your state's plan is. So basically, the 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 um, operation warp speed and uh, then the uh, CDC and then the American, um, the immunization, uh, College the, of immunization the ACIP, ACIP. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, have put out what are recommendations in terms of who they feel should be vaccinated first and then sort of how these, the rollout should be phased. Um, but states actually have their own uh, decision-making power in terms of how the rollout should occur. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm not privy to all of the, you know, all of the plans within each state. I mean, I, what I'm thinking about for me and, you know, in knowing about New York is that uh, there are five phases. Um, in phase one, we're doing the healthcare workers and the um, people in long-term care facilities, uh, both the workers and the uh, residents of those facilities. 
Um, and, you know, that'll be hopefully in late December and January. And then phase two, I believe that New York at this point is going to opt for vaccinating first responders. So those are the fire, the police, the National Guard, um, teachers and school staff, uh, and then public health workers and other sort of frontline workers that are interacting with the public. So grocery store workers, transit employees, um, those people who are really critical for maintaining the infrastructure of you know, the city and, and the, uh, of the state. Um, there will probably in this be in this phase as well, phase two, some other um, individuals living in congregate set settings. I'm not sure if uh, prisons are going to be included in, in this phase, um, but there are going to be some individuals who are in the general population are being, you know, are particularly at particularly high risk due to their comorbidities and health conditions that could be vaccinated in phase two. And when would that be? And then, that's still in phase two, but no, I mean, but what time? What time? Oh, would it be? I think January, I, February. I think, yeah, I mean, I would say March. I, I oh, actually wow. don't know. I think it's it's really hard to know. So this um, is going to really be over a period of many months. It is, and then I think phase three would be. I mean, maybe February for phase two, but then phase three is individuals over sixty-five, um, individuals under sixty-five with high-risk comorbidities and health conditions. Phase four is the rest of the essential workers. And then in phase five is healthy adults and children. So. So that should be reassuring to all the people who are really not the highest risk, who are more worried about yeah. the vaccine. You mm -hmm. know, I've had people come to me and say, I'm so worried. I've heard my children are gonna be forced to get the vaccine. So they won't be able to go to school without the vaccine. And there's, they're not going to get it even. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't think they will, not at this point. I mean, I think that, um, the children, because they haven't really been studied yet, I mean, they're, they're beginning to study kids. Um, you know, the Pfizer trial is now um, enrolling down to age 12. Mm -hmm. And um, there are other uh, trials that are going to look into phasing in um, children into their, uh, into their trials, into their phase three trials. So um, the, the thing about the kids is that um, what may happen is there may not be placebo controlled trials with kids, which I, I, I am happy about. Mm -hmm. um, usually what they will do is take all of the data that's accumulated for the adult population and you know, they'll, they'll know what are the sort of immune correlates of protection. Um, and with those, they can assess the immunogenicity in kids, uh, make sure that, are, that they're achieving the same levels of antibody neutralizing antibody T cell responses that adults are, and then um, you know go from there. So that's what we do with many other vaccines, and I think that that's the approach um, that people will take um, with the, with um, children in the COVID vaccine program as well. Mm -hmm. And what about pregnant women? Pregnant women, I actually don't know about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, I mean I know that they've been excluded for all of, for all of the phase three trials um, to date, um, and I don't know if there are plans to include them. At this I, mean, point. I, I think the basic the basic principle is we're trying to weigh risks and balances. Yeah. Right. Because if you don't get the vaccine, then you're at risk for COVID, which mm -hmm. is risky for a pregnant women. So it's it's going to have to be a balance. But we're we're definitely not there yet in terms of knowledge. Right. That we can say for sure. So I, this segues to a natural question, which is, mm -hmm. well, why don't I just get natural immunity? Wouldn't it be Would it be better? Do we know even to mm -hmm. be able to compare immunity from the disease? and immunity yeah. from the vaccine? I don't think we can compare it yet. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, there is some reason to believe that, you know, uh, I mean, based on the immunogenicity data of some of these trials, that you know, it's very, very robust. Um, it's even more robust than a lot of convalescent plasma um, in terms of neutralizing antibody. There's so a big range. Sorry, you mean the, the disease or the vaccine? Sorry, the vaccine. Okay, fine, perfect. So it induces, mm -hmm. you know, very nice levels of antibody uh, and, and neutralizing antibody in most of these candidates that I've seen. So, um, you know, and, there, and with convalescent, uh, convalescent uh, titer, uh, titers, there's a big range in terms of what people as individuals produce. Um, so you may be a person who produces very little neutralizing antibody and, uh, you know, per, and then would there, would there be a suggestion that then uh, you may be more susceptible to getting, you know, reinfected. Uh, you know, I, I don't know the answer. Um, but I, I think that, um, um, the, you know, we don't know if, if natural, 
we don't know which will cause um, sort of longer lasting immunity. Mm-hmm. Um, right. We do believe that, you know, people, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a big risk, I think, to, to get COVID um, right. rather than get the vaccine. So, you know, just thinking about it numerically, I mean, it, you know, the risk of getting a, an adverse reaction from the vaccine is, you know, very, 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 very low. The risk that you could become, you know, a COVID long hauler, develop a vasculitis, could develop a cardiomyopathy, even if you're a young person, Mm -hmm. it's not insignificant. And there, I think there's so many dangers about this virus that we just don't know about, Um, you know, and too too much uncertainty uh, in terms of our own, you know, predicting our own individual risk of complications that I, I would, I would not recommend taking that risk. Right. And we also don't know how long natural immunity lasts. We're certainly getting repeat cases, which we may or may mm-hmm. not be underestimating. So yeah. people shouldn't think I've got it. I've got it for life. I'm good. Because that's not necessarily true. It may not be true. I mean, yeah. I, I am hopeful that it may last longer than, I mean, we've seen it last now, I think six months. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's somewhat reassuring. So you may not, if you've had prior COVID, necessarily have to run and get this vaccine right away you, you probably can wait mm-hmm. you know to to you know have some more data accumulate um, I mean, and they haven't studied it on people who've had it so correct yeah and i think you know you know just if people are if people are concerned and they just want to get this vaccine you know there were people within these trials who had had covid and we mm-hmm. we, we didn't know um until you know, there was no the, the trials definitely, you know, they, they say that, you know, if you've had a confirmed case of COVID that you're ex- excluded from the trial, but there have certainly been um, people who didn't even know that they had COVID who entered the trial and then, you know, were found to have antibody on the first uh, blood draw. So, you know, and I, I you know, from my, not, from my knowledge, I, I have not seen that there have been any adverse reaction in those participants, but, you know, I, I, I don't know the data to any granular detail. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other other thing to keep in mind is I think a lot of people think that it, th- doing something that might have an effect is worse than doing nothing and still catching COVID, right? I mean, you're making a decision either way. When you're making mm-hmm. a decision not to get the vaccine, you're taking the risk of COVID. Don't think you're right. not, you know. Yeah. I mean, I really do feel that it, it will be one or the other. You know the way that this virus is spreading, particularly now as we're in the winter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know eventually you'll get COVID or you'll get a vaccine. I think it's it's the pandemic's not going to end. You know, unless one of those two outcomes happen. Right, and the other concern is whether enough people will get this to get to herd immunity. And I think, that is a concern. <laughs> I, I think that you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's going to be it's going to be a long tunnel because I think that we really have to be really transparent and really honest and really respectful of people's fears, and understand that people are going to some people are going to be ready and some people are not. Even some people in the higher risk groups um, are not necessarily going to be comfortable with getting the vaccine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I, that the higher know. risk you are, the easier a decision it is. I mean, I know for me, mm-hmm. you know, at first I was like, I don't know, this is new technology. I mean, I felt scared. Um, mm-hmm. And now I'm thinking, but I'm a healthcare worker and I'm in my late 50s. Who am I kidding? So yeah. to me, as soon as they offer it, I'm sticking out my arm. Yeah, I am as well. I'll, I'll be in line. <laughs> so. but, but not everybody will feel the same way about their risk benefit equation. I mean, hopefully they'll be able to make you know, good risk benefit equations, right? right? I mean, somebody who's elderly and is stuck in their home, that's a terrible thing. Yeah, right? I, I do think you have to weigh mental health in this as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think that, you know, it's going to be transformative right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, you know, we're still going to be wearing masks, you know, as mm-hmm. you pointed out, because we don't know that people with the vaccine, um, you know, can they shed it's not, can they acquire, not, they're not going to be shedding because of the, the vaccine. I want to make that perfectly clear. Like this is not giving you live COVID vaccine. They're not right. going to shed the virus. Um, absolutely. You know, that's very clear. But if they do get asymptomatic COVID um, and then they're shedding virus for, you know, let's say it's a very brief period of time, 24 or 48 hours, you know, we, do, we would expect it to the viral shedding to be dramatically um, more short lived. And again, they'd be shedding it not because they got the vaccine, but because the vaccine didn't prevent them from getting it. Exactly. I just want to make that clear. 
because there's yes. been a lot of misconceptions about vaccines causing you to shed. This is not a live virus vaccine, at least the ones that we're talking about are not even weak in live vaccines. So right. you cannot possibly transmit the virus when you get the vaccine, only if you catch it despite getting the vaccine. Exactly. And you don't have symptoms, so people right. don't know. Right. And we don't know that yet. And that's going to be a very important thing for us to know is whether it's going to really prevent the transmission and has to prevent the asymptomatic, not just dampen your symptoms. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I correct? Yes, we're not going to know. And I yeah. think that, um, you know, it'll, so it will be some time that we will be wearing masks and distancing, even though we have vaccine available and even if we're vaccinated. So, you know, I'm not planning to just, you know, you know, I don't know, two, two weeks after my second dose, I'm not just, you know, taking off my mask and running around. I, I think I, you know, I still have to be cautious and, you know, make sure that I'm protecting my patients um, and my family, although my husband has already been under trial and I believe has gotten vaccine. Uh, right. So, um, you know, but I do, I do want to continue to protect my loved ones. So, um, you know, we will be wearing masks and we will be distancing for at least some period of time. And so the actual cases uh, have declined significantly. And I've heard people say, well, why would I bother to get a vaccine if I'm going to have to wear a mask anyway? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I just, I don't know. I, I don't want to get COVID. I really right. don't. Right, because, that because, yeah, right, because we're, we're, still, we're still doing this. We're still building this boat as we float it, right? I mean, we're in the mm -hmm. middle of science in, in progress. And so it's like layers of Swiss cheese again. We don't know yet how good this vaccine is in the real world, right? We know how good it mm -hmm. is in trials and we're going to learn it as we go along. And so to be careful, you want to use all the levels of protection you can get. And also there'll be people who are not willing to get the vaccine. Now, if only they would wear the masks and distance. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that there's going to still be significant groups of people who both won't get the vaccine and won't be wearing the mask, et cetera. Right. And that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. And that's why we're going to still have, you know, thousands and thousands of deaths from this infection. Right, because it will continue to spread. In order to get herd immunity, we have to, what, have how many percent of the population immune? Isn't it like 70? I, yeah, I mean, I still, I still think that that's not very well known with this. But I, I you know, I, I would say, yeah, probably that or north of that. Mm -hmm. so. Right. So we're going to have transmission. It's going to continue to be circulating until we can get a vaccine that we, right? that we for sure is safe and effective and that enough people have taken it because they see that it's safe and effective. Right. And that's, by the way, so, so, so important for people to get good information and not to listen to not good information. Right. Yeah. There are uh, good it's, sources. It's, and it's, it's hard to know where to find good information. I mean, I understand that people, you know, it's, it's very difficult. It's, we are in a sort of in, informational overload and it's very hard to know, know where to get good information. I'm going to just mention two two sources that, that I know about, just two mm -hmm. more recent ones, and that is Dan Grove has a blog called My COVID Journey, and he also has a YouTube channel, Dr. Dan Grove or Dan Grove. And on his YouTube channel, he's been interviewing Dr. Naor Barzaev on the COVID vaccine. He has two parts out. We put it up as a podcast. He let us borrow it very kindly, um, and he's doing part three. So those are an excellent, excellent review of the vaccine, and he has uh, many other talks on COVID-related topics. Um, YouTube videos, um, and he's got his blog, and there is um, also um, Dr. Um, Glott, of course, Rabbi Dr. Glott has been doing, um, almost every month, say Shabbat, he's been doing talks, and his talks are up on YouTube. So those are two super, super informative talks on, on COVID in general and in the vaccine um, in specific. So people listen to this and say, hey, I have so many more questions. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to interview Dr. Glatt myself soon. Um, there is information out there. Those are just, you know, my place mm -hmm. and those two other places are, are three, um, hopefully, reliable sources for people. Yeah, they're excellent. Right. Um, thank you. So also, I want to ask, are there any people that should not get these vaccines? So what about people who are on biologic medications mm -hmm. like for Crohn's, all sort of colitis? Multiple yeah, it's grossers. tricky because it's tricky for them because they have not included a lot of these um, people in trials. And I think that, you know, there's a concern that they would have less of an immunologic response. Um, and therefore, you know, that they're not in the phase three trials because they may get a case and therefore it's going to reduce the efficacy of the, of the, of the, of the uh, vaccine. 
Um, I, I do think it needs to be evaluated, um, but there may be, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess my feeling is that these sort of second generation vaccines, the, the protein, the recombinant pro, the purified protein with adjuvants um, would be a very, um, you know, sort of nice uh, vaccine, sort of very well um, even though we haven't evaluated yet these vaccines in clinic phase three trials, they may prove to be a nice, safe, and um, immun immunogenic vaccines that I think could be tolerated by people with um, who are on biologics. But I think we don't know yet. Um, mm. I, I, I just don't know. Um, right. We'll I, think, to, to right. I think we're going to have a lot more real world data as we start um, mm -hmm. immunizing super high risk populations. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that to me is, is, is actually reassuring that we are going to have so much more data. We have tens of thousands of people already in the phase mm -hmm. three trials, but once we do real yeah. world vaccinating, we're going to have a ton of information quickly. Right. And, you know, it may be that the first vaccines coming out, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer will license, you know, not license, but will have an EUA to use in people who have these conditions. And there will be people who choose to get them. And then we'll have data from those people. And you know, if you're if you're somebody who's kind of on the fence about this, you may want to wait until that data comes out. Mm -hmm. So we, we'll we'll see. Now we talk about data. Some people are like, well, I just want long term data. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> but I think you know, there's always. I mean, we're we're in the midst of a pandemic. You know, with thousands of people, you know, getting sick and thousands of people dying. Right. So I, I think. There's no way that, you know, we could wait for long-term data um, to prevent additional mortality from this disease. And it, but I think, you know, we've, we've done what we've needed to do. I think we've done it very safely. Um, and we've assessed all of these uh, vaccine candidates very carefully um, in the, in, with, with all of the proper steps taken. So we've done phase one, phase two, three, phase three trials, um, all the preclinical data is there. And you know, I, I've been really uh, impressed with the way in which these have these have been trialed. And I think that what's been impressive to me, yes, you know, I think it's the timeline is is incredible. Um, but I think that the timeline is incredible because of uh, several different factors. One, I think it's important to recognize that. Um, the the government took a lot of the risk away from the companies in terms of vaccine development uh, because it basically pre-bought all of the uh, you know many of these uh, vaccines you know hundreds of millions of doses of that these vaccines um, so you know prior to them even being in phase three trials so that took a lot of the risk off of the companies and was allowed them to proceed with development um, and manufacturing so manufacturing has been done at the same time as even the trials have been conducted. Um, and then, you know, the Department of Defense is, is taking over the distribution. So that that distribution is going to be orchestrated, you know, in a you know, very logistical, uh, hopefully efficient way um, so that that's all ready to go. I mean, there's so many things to think about. There's the vials, there's the syringes, there's the shipping. The cold um, storage. Uh -huh. The cold storage, all of that that needs to go into this. So all of that's been in the planning, even while phase three trials were still underway. So that's, you know, I've been impressed with that level of coordination. I've also been really impressed with the level of coordination, even doing the trials. So again, you know, for Pfizer and then, you know, for Moderna, I'm a part of the COVPN, which is then the NIH organization for the COVID prevention network. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've, every week we're, we're on the calls with all of the, directors of the Moderna vaccine trials, the Johnson & Johnson, the AstraZeneca, and now the Novavax. And we're talking about these trials and the infrastructure that was put into place very quickly to, um, for these academic centers to do these trials was incredible. It was all done over Zoom and, you know, people just got hired and, uh, you know, got the logistical infrastructure in place to be able to do this quickly. So that level of collaboration has given me a lot of confidence in these vaccines and, you know, uh, you know, confidence that they've been, that all of these trials have been done effectively and uh, very safely and thoroughly. Right. And no corners have been cut in safety. I think that cannot be said enough that mm -hmm. 
it, I wish they didn't call it Operation Warp Speed because that immediately makes people think that it was done too fast. But mm -hmm. all the same trials have been done. Right. right. You've taken away the logistics. You've taken away the financial. You've taken mm -hmm. away the bureaucracy. Uh huh. Yes. I mean, it's really incredible to me, and I think that this shows how efficient we can actually be. I know. <laughs> if, if no we, excuse yeah. anymore for bureaucracy. <laughs> exactly. I know. <laughs> So I want to thank you so much. I mean, I know there's so much more to talk about and you've been oh, so yeah. generous with your time over and over and given us so much good information. I cannot thank you enough. You're very welcome. And please, uh, I look forward to hearing um, Dr. Glatt's podcast as well. I'm excited yes. about that. Yes, thank you so, so much. All right, wonderful. Thank you. You too.